Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I am your host, Cliff Sargent. Welcome to my hackneyed kind of setup. Um, not at my usual headquarters back in Los Angeles. I'm all the way on the East Coast, somewhere in bed in Brooklyn, in New York, visiting. And uh, I've commandeered my friend's bedroom here that he's a uh, so kindly submitted to me for the time being, but uh, yeah, hope you guys are doing good. I got something really awesome for you today. So let's get to it. This is. Um, well, what's the actual? What's the, how do you say it? In Gest In Stalgewitten. In Stalgewitten. In, Sch in Stalgewitten. Storm of Steel by Ernst Junger. Uh, Ernst Junger was a soldier and author. He was a soldier in World War I. German soldier in World War I, born in Heidelberg in 1895. And he lived until 1998. I mean, he was 102 years old. This guy had gone through the whole thing. World War I, World War II. He saw the whole century, right? There's not many people who can say that. Um, you know, he... He joined the the war, the World War One, when he was very, very young. Basically, you know, Storm of Steel, Stalkovitern is um, a a novel, a first-hand account of being in the trenches in World War One. Um, by a nineteen-year-old, you know, he was extremely young. Uh, he ran away from school. And I think he, like, tried to join, like, the Foreign Legion. He ran away from school, and I think he tried to join the Foreign Legion in Armenia or something. But then he volunteered uh, to be in the German army. And this is his diary, basically. You know, the, it's, it's obviously been revised many, many times, but, you know, uh, the basis was his diary in the war. I always wanted somebody who hadn't been severely affected, you know, like somebody who was of relatively sound mind to describe what it's like to to be in war, you know. I'm always fascinated by that kind of thing. But you know me, you know, I'm all about death, so. But who is it? I don't know. Um... But, you know, I've been lucky enough to have some people in my lifetime, you know, give me first-hand accounts of what it was like to be in war from several different wars. Um, my, a colleague of mine, my friend at school, uh, had uh, fought in Afghanistan, and I think he was over there uh, around the time of that first big battle in Fallujah. But uh, man, I'm not I'm not quite certain. But he, I remember he was at this compound in the middle of the desert, right? He he had no problem telling me about stories. You know, he he even you know kind of prefaced it. He said like a lot of people uh, have have issues talking about it with him. Had no issue with it whatsoever. I think he even like went so far as to say that he didn't believe in um, uh, what whatever the the syndrome is. You know, the traumatic stressful syndrome uh, that escapes my thought for some reason right now you know post-traumatic stress disorder or whatever PTSD that's right he he basically vetoed the the notion of PTSD which was interesting for a soldier you know who'd seen so much shit obviously but uh, he was at a compound in the middle of the desert in Afghanistan right and um, the day he arrives to this compound uh, sitting out front is this burlap sack and there's like a, a, a boot sticking out of the top and then there's like a guy's you know severed head 
upon one part of the sack, and he says, what the fuck is that? And they said, oh, you know, these guys are like, oh, those, those are the puzzle men. And they said, he says, what the hell, what, why do you call them the puzzle men? He said, well, because we can't figure out which body part goes with which body. Basically, what it was, was it was a couple of insurgents who had uh, uh, driven a truck into the side of uh, this uh, this compound, and they they had killed some U.S. soldiers, and uh, but they they couldn't figure out whose was whose of these guys, so they basically like just rounded it up, put it in a sack, and stuck it out front. And I think that uh, he mentioned and I'm pretty sure this is true. It's totally messed up, but I mean, I think the the U.S. soldiers were so pissed that they actually nailed the the skin of this guy's face to the side of a wall or something as like a as like a warning sign or something like because of the blast of the explosion this guy's face had actually literally been like you know ripped off of his but it was intact and so they like hung it up and nailed it to the side of this wall something crazy like that another another account that was that I always remember, which I really liked, which is, you know, completely different war, but also very interesting, was uh, from my dad, actually. My dad, who was uh, drafted into Vietnam in, uh, you know, I don't know the exact year, but, uh, you know, he was, so he was born in 46, so he was like 19, he was like 18, 19 when he went to Vietnam and he told me the, the grossest story which I actually really I think is pretty awesome um, he had a he had an abscess uh, under you know in his mouth under a tooth you know so it was like swollen and there's like pus and shit and he's it, that that is, the day that he gets dropped you know into the jungle um, he's you know got this horrible like toothache and this abscess so of course the first thing they do to these young kids when they're in the jungle is uh, they get them used to gunfire right so the entire platoon uh you know the, the lieutenant's just like all right light them up and they just turn towards this you know this uh this hill in the jungle and they just start shooting just to get these boys used to the sound of gunfire and they just like start shooting up all these plants and uh my dad said the rattling from the gunfire was so strong that it was just like, Arr. and so he just said, fuck it. And he just bit down, you know, he just like clenched his jaw as hard as he could. The whole thing broke, all the pus filled his mouth. He spit it out and then it healed. And that was the beginning of the war for him. Another one was when uh, he was in Saigon on the day of the Tet Offensive, and um, he was stationed with 300 soldiers in, in downtown Saigon. 300 or something like that. Like on like the 15th story of this hotel, this skyscraper, right? And uh, they were completely unarmed. So, the morning of the Tet Offensive, they begin to realize something's, something's up because, you know, there's a, there's a curfew that's been installed. And uh, normally, you know, 6 a.m. hits and like, or 5 a.m. or whatever, and the streets are like packed. Everybody's got to do their shit. They're getting groceries. They're doing, the, you know, they're going to work. They're whatever, you know. Uh, Today, nobody's on the street. Nothing is happening. And then they start to hear gunfire and they see smoke in the distance. And then the little bicycle taxis come in, and, but they're carrying wounded. And so gradually, they see this whole shit show just happening, you know, getting larger by the hour. And uh, they end up, like I said, at night, on like the 15th floor of this hotel building with no guns. Uh, drinking at the bar, watching the entire city of Saigon catch on fire. And, you know, he was, Dad said he was like, it looked like Godzilla was just walking through the whole thing. 
and they said they opened the windows and they could hear uh, they said it sounded like the ocean because of all the gunfire now I just thought that was incredible so anyways war stories so yeah like I said the Stalgovitchen was based on the diary of Ernst Jünger. And it was, it might have been the first personal account of uh, somebody in the trenches from World War I that was published or, or that was written. But it, you know, even if it wasn't, uh, many people believe it's the most important. So, as Michael Hoffman puts it in the introduction, he said, it has no pacifist design, right? <clears throat> it doesn't plead to either, either side, for or against war. But, you know, later on when uh, Junger, Junger was captured, um, later on when, you know, the Nazis came to power, you know, he was courted for, uh, you know, they, they admired Junger, of course, you know, to be expected. You know, um, and they definitely courted him and they said, you know, they offered him these, these very prestigious academic roles and uh, positions, but, uh, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't interested. And what fascinated me was he actually wasn't a member, or at least that's what it says. You know, he says he wasn't a member of the Nazi party, which is very interesting because some of the stuff that he's written is pretty like, well, you know, this cannot be said for Martin Heidegger. Ooh, shots fired. He might have been a little bit more of an opportunist, but... Uh, I think somebody said that, you know, Junger was, was much more um, interior, you know. He was a thinker. He was a fighter, but he was a thinker. So... You know, in, in the writing itself, uh, you know, the physical is given priority over the ideological, right? Um, which is, makes for such a better read. Uh, you know, this, this, this account of trench warfare in all of these towns across France. And, um, you know, I could use words like, like you know, ad nauseum, like, visceral or tangible or, or textural or, you know, the, yeah. The, I mean, the physicality of it is profound. So his writing is enviably, enviably concise and simple. It's friendly, interestingly. Uh, it's it's passionate, but it's not uh, verbose or pretentious or ideological. You know, it's uh, it's it's almost, especially in the way that he treats you know victims or injuries and death and so on. It's it's almost um, it's almost objective, right? Those those passages can seem like almost like surgical sometimes. Like this happened, and so as you'll see, I'll read from that in a little bit, but. Um, you know, again, it's it's not grandiose or pleading to either side. He's certainly not a pacifist, but then again, you know, he's not holding back and showing, you know, he's not pretending like this is just glory, glory, glory. I mean, this is some horrifying shit. I mean, some truly horrifying accounts of being, you know, in hell on earth. It sometimes feels like this very perplexing, very complicated and perplexing dream because it's like shifting back and forth from nightmare and it's, but it's not a fully fledged nightmare, it's this, you know. I guess that's kind of a sign that it seems to be, you know, an honest human experience. You can't call it one thing or the other. It's full of contradictions and it's 
It's fascinating. I'll give you this one. Let's start off, huh? Let's start off, shall we? Why don't we start off with this passage at a midnight cemetery? <clears throat> We were marching along a wide road which ran in the moonlight like a white ribbon across the dark countryside towards the thunder of guns, whose voracious roar grew ever more immeasurable. Abandon all hope. What gave the scene a particularly sinister aspect was the way all the roads were clearly visible, like a network of white veins in the moonlight, and there was no living being on them. We marched as on the gleaming paths of a midnight cemetery. And that's, that's even more, that's about as poetic as he gets, right? He doesn't really embellish a lot of situations. Uh, that just gives you a very beautiful image of the moment right before everything goes to hell. So, you know, there's nothing glorious about trench life. But the camaraderie and the day-to-day -day activities start to become kind of funny, you know, because you're doing the best you can with the men around you, uh, given the available um, resources and the circumstances, you know. So at tea time, things can get quite cozy. He's got kind of like this aristocratic vibe to him. He's not a dandy and, you know, but, you know, he was wearing suits and, you know, lived in a chateau when he was older and kind of had this this kind of you know learned man of sophistication air about him but anyways at tea time things can get quite cozy the ensign is often required to provide company for one or other of the senior officers things are done with formality and some style a couple of china cup a, a couple of china cups on a hessian tablecloth Afterwards, the officer's Batman will leave a bottle and glasses out on the wobbly table. Conversation becomes more personal. It's a curious thing that even here, other people remain the most popular subject of conversation. Trench gossip flourishes in these afternoon sessions, almost as in a small town garrison. Superiors, comrades, and inferiors may all be subjected to vigorous criticism, and a fresh rumor makes its way through all six commanders' dugouts along the line in no time at all, it seems. So you have this kind of insight into the, the mindset of a lot of these men, um, who are coping with, you know, what what is going to be the worst part of their lives if they survive it. Um, but of course, it doesn't take long before you actually get to, the descriptions, of, violence. It's so interesting the way, the manner in which he describes the body's reaction to being, you know, in these moments of completely high stress. I mean, you know, the, the most terrifying moments of your life are excellent. I mean, listen to this. These moments of nocturnal prowling leave an indelible impression. Eyes and ears are tensed to the maximum. The rustling approach of strange feet and the tall grass is an unutterably menacing thing. Your breath comes in shallow bursts. You have to force yourself to stifle any panting or wheezing. 
there is a little mechanical click as the safety catch of your pistol of your pistol is taken off. The sound cuts straight through your nerves. Your teeth are grinding on the fuse pin of the hand grenade. The encounter will be short and murderous. You tremble with two contradictory impulses, the heightened awareness of the huntsman and the terror of the quarry. You are a world to yourself, saturated with the appalling aura of the savage landscape. Isn't that beautiful? You are a world to yourself, saturated with the appalling aura of the savage landscape. Hmm. I can't get I can't win with this lighting. I really can't. I'm trying. Yeah, that's just gonna have to do it if it gets dark. Fix it in post. Fix it in post if it gets dark. Occasionally my ears were utterly deafened by a single fiendish crashing burst of flame. Then incessant hissing gave me the sense of hundreds of pounds of weights rushing down at an incredible speed, one after the other, or a dud shell landed with a short heavy ground shaking thump shrapnels burst by the dozen like dainty crackers shook loose their balls in a dense cloud and the empty casings rasped after they were gone each time a shell landed anywhere close the earth flew up and down and metal shards drove themselves into it it's an easier matter to describe these sounds than to endure them of course because one cannot but associate every single sound of flying steel with the idea of death. And so I huddled in my hole in the ground with my hand in front of my face, imagining all the possible variants of being hit. I think I have found a comparison that captures a situation in which I and all the other soldiers who took part in this war so often found ourselves. You must imagine that you are securely tied to a post, being menaced by... A man swinging a heavy hammer. Now the hammer has been taken back over his head, ready to swing, and now it's cleaving the air towards you on the point of touching your skull, then it struck the post, and the splinters are flying. That's what it's like to experience heavy shelling in an exposed position. Luckily, I still had a bit of that subliminal feeling of optimism, it'll be alright, that you feel during a game, say and which, while it may be quite unfounded, still has a soothing effect on you. And indeed, even the shelling came to an end, and I could go on my way once more, and this time, with some urgency. It's always going to be all right, right? It'll be all right until it's not. We keep telling ourselves that, which is, which is very interesting, you know, because even in the worst, the worst case situations in this book, it's, it's amazing um, how the human body just uh, has this kind of, um, or the human mind, mind or body, whatever, has this uh, this inherited this internal form of like it just refuses to give up right it it's almost like not capable there's like this intrinsic quality that just doesn't allow us to not say oh well it will be all right you know it's like what was it Samuel Beckett line I can't go on I must go on I can't go on I'll go on yeah well you have to you know and it's kind of like how we're built which is fascinating to me and if that it's not one big testament to it. Oh, I don't know. Oh, just myself. So. So he doesn't escape all of it, though. He was injured quite a bit, actually. And uh, there's one very famous line in this book um, that comes from his surgeon. Uh, you know, or the, this, you know, this guy who's pulling a shrapnel ball out of him with no anesthetic, uh, or something like that. I mean, I'll, uh, I'll read you the passage. It's just, excuse me, it's incredible. My favorite in the book, maybe. 
After my comrades had bandaged up the wound, they carried me across the street, needless to say, through fire, to the catacombs, and there laid me on the operating table. While a breathless Lieutenant Vetje, Vetje, I think, held my head, while a, while a breathless Lieutenant Vetje held my head, our medical major cut out the shrapnel ball with scissors and knife. I don't think they had anesthetic. And told me I was a lucky man because the ball had passed. I told me I was a lucky man because the ball had passed between the shin bone and the fibula without harming either. Haben sua fata libelli et bali, the old corps student observed while he left a medical orderly to bandage up the wound. Haben sua fata libelli et bali. I'm probably screwing that up. It's Latin. But that translates to books and bullets have their own destinies. Isn't that great? He gives a lot of magnificent accounts of what it's like to be under the duress of having to battle with the elements of just, you know, uh, pure wet and, you know, cold and how that just breaks you. Shivering and trembling without a dry stitch on our, on our bodies. Shivering and trembling without a dry stitch on our bodies, we stood there knowing the next bombardment would find us utterly helpless on a muddy road. It was a wretched morning. Once again, I learned that no artillery bombardment is as capable of breaking resistance in the same measure as the elemental forces of wet and cold. And that seems really true. You know, that seems like a really honest account of warfare, where just the sheer duress of combating the elements is even worse than fighting other men, you know? So, overall it feels like a timeless, timeless, beautiful, and A terrifying account of what it means to be trapped in the middle of that um, impossible goal, you know. It's hard to imagine as a Westerner who's never seen combat, you know, what that must be like, but... And a lot of his critics, I think, thought that he was glorifying war as this transcendent thing, but I, I really think that he's just like... Look, I mean, you know, I mean, it is transcendent in some fashion. It's going to change you. Maybe not for the better. And many... You know, people react to it differently. Everybody's circumstance is different. I guess it's not, you know, it's... It's not good or bad, right? It, but it is fascinating. Because, you know, he, he's shot and he thinks he's going to die. You know, close to the end of this book. That is a major component of it. It had got me at last. At the same time as feeling I had been hit, I felt the bullet taking my life away. I had felt death's hand once before on the road at Mori, but this time his grip was firmer and more determined. As I came down heavily in the bottom of the trench, I was convinced it was all over. Strangely, that moment is one of the very few in my life of which I am able to say they were utterly happy. I understood, as in a flash of lightning, the true inner purpose and form of my life. I felt surprise and disbelief that it was to end there and then, but the surprise had something untroubled and almost merry about it. Then I heard the firing grow less, as if I were a stone sinking under the surface of some turbulent water. Where I was going, there was neither war 
nor enmity. I mean, that's incredible. Like, fuck. Better than food. Better than food. I think that's my favorite real life account of somebody who thinks he's who thinks he's gonna die you know and maybe that's just kind of like the optimist inside me but it's great Anyways, yeah. In Stahlgewittern, Storm of Steel by Ernst Jünger. I hope you enjoyed this. Just a little afternoon recommendation of some really intense literature. If war is not your thing, you may still even find yourself enjoying some passages about it. Um, yeah. I promise I'm going to do some stuff that's a little bit lighter soon. Uh, but, uh, yeah, in the meantime, I mean, this is... This is incredible. Well, I hope all of you guys are doing well. Um, please, if you can donate to Patreon, uh, I would sincerely appreciate it. Um, all of it supports the channel, and uh, as long as you guys are watching, I'll keep doing what I'm doing. And um, yeah, subscribe and recommend some stuff if you can. I mean, my my backlog is tremendous right now so you know it may take me a while to get to it but um, you guys are recommending just ins like insanely good stuff you know so I can't spend enough hours of the day of the day reading but uh, yeah. Um, yeah always remember what John Waters said if you if you go home with someone and they don't have any books don't fuck them Have a great day, guys. Ciao.